In this video, we want to look at constant acceleration for objects that are moving in two dimensions. And this is best explained with an example. You can solve these problems by applying the same ideas from one dimension for the two coordinates. For this example, you stand on the edge of a 100 meter cliff overlooking the ocean. You throw a rock with a speed of 24 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal. How long does it take to hit the water and how far did it go? As always, we start with a picture. So here's my person at the top of a cliff. The cliff is 100 meters tall. So a rock is thrown. I'm not told anything about how far above the ground the rock is when the rock is thrown. And the person is small compared to 100 meters. So I'm going to assume the rock left the point at the top of the cliff, 100 meters above the ocean. It's given a speed of 24 meters per second, and we were told that it was delivered at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the horizontal. What physics applies to this problem? Well, I know the acceleration is constant because the only acceleration is that due to gravity. And so I have my constant acceleration relationships. I just have to look at both the x and the y coordinate. The first thing I have to do, though, if I'm going to use those relationships, is I have to choose two points in time. And so I think it's pretty clear the two points in time I'm interested in are the time that it left, the initial time, which I'll call zero, and then the final time when it hits the ocean. I'll call that just t, so my time interval delta t is also just t. We must have a coordinate system, and that can be anywhere. I chose the origin to be here at the base of the cliff, and I chose positive x to the right and positive y up. So now, as part of the brainstorming stage, I just want to get out everything I know and everything I don't know. Do I know my initial x and my initial final position? Yes, my initial x position is zero, given my coordinate system. My final position is unknown. In fact, that's something I want to know. How far did it go? And I'm just calling that x. Do I know my initial velocity in the x direction? I do know that. That's the x component of the velocity. And the x component of that velocity, given my picture, is going to be the length of a right triangle, where the hypotenuse is the magnitude of the velocity, which is 24 meters per second. And since the x component here is adjacent to my angle, the x component is going to be the magnitude times cosine theta. Do I know the final velocity? Well, not yet. However, I know that the x acceleration is zero, and since the x acceleration is zero, the final x component of the velocity has to equal the initial x component of the velocity. So what do I know about what's happening in the y dimension? What's my initial y position? Well, that's 100 meters given the coordinate system where the zero is down at the ocean. What's the final y position? Well, that's when it hits the ocean, so y final is equal to zero. Do I know my y component of the initial velocity? And I do, for the same reason I knew the x component, it's going to be the length of this side of a right triangle where the magnitude is 24 meters per second. And so it will be the speed times sine theta. I don't know the final y velocity because it will be accelerating this whole time. I do know that the acceleration given this coordinate system will be negative g. So I've brought everything I know and everything I don't know together, and I have my constant acceleration relationships. I have the ones for x here, and of course the ones for y look exactly the same with x replaced by y, and the x subscripts replaced by y subscripts. Can I use any of these to find time? First of all, I remember that if I want to know how long it takes something to fall, I'm only interested in motion in the y dimension. And motion along the x doesn't affect motion along the y. So for the constant acceleration equations in y, can any of these give me the time? Well, the last one doesn't have time in it at all. And for the middle one, I don't know time, but I don't know the final y component of the velocity. But this first one, I know a, I know the initial y component of the velocity. I know the y final and y initial positions, so it looks like in the y dimension I can use that to find time directly. So go ahead and grabbing that equation, 
and plugging in the numbers for final y position, initial y position. Here's the initial y velocity, magnitude sine theta, and the acceleration in y. I put in those numbers and I get a quadratic equation. I've brought the positive 4.9 to the other side, as well as the negative 100 and negative 12t. I can use a quadratic formula to solve that, which is negative b, b squared minus 4ac over 2a. I put those numbers into my calculator and I get 12 plus or minus nearly 46 divided by 9.8. Now if I look at those possibilities, of course, one of those is going to be negative and I must have a time greater than zero, so I know I have to choose the one with the plus sign. And my calculator shows that that gives me a time of 5.9 seconds. I may need this to calculate other parameters, so I'm keeping more significant figures at the moment. But if I were to give an answer, say I was told to give it to three significant figures, it would be 5.91 seconds. So finally, I need to know how far it went and that means what was its final x-coordinate. And it seems pretty easy to use this equation again for the x-coordinate since the acceleration in the x-direction is zero. The initial x-coordinate is zero, so the final x-position is simply the x-component of the velocity times a time interval. The x-component of the velocity is just v cosine theta, I showed here, times the time we just found. The result is 122.73 meters, or to three significant figures, 123. You can apply constant acceleration equations to x and y separately. You can use time to link them together because an object will have a single set of x, y coordinates for each point in time.